So uh, how would you categorize your preaching? Expository, narrative, topical? How, how would you, uh, how would you <laughs> Well, you know, now we're in this program and we've been reading the definitions of these genres, <laughs> we see how very fluid they are. <laughs> you know, uh, you gotta give McClure's book, uh, <laughs> Preaching Terminology. <laughs> um, I would probably say a hybrid of expository and narrative. Mm -hmm. First of all, no genre is set in a structure boundary, and I think all of us, if we're good at preaching, will attempt to preach in different voices and different genres throughout the life. But 80% of the time, we probably narrow in. So I've personally defined my preaching as prescriptive preaching, mm -hmm. um, in that I try to merge what I identify as a relevant life issue that is prevalent within the congregation and a text where that relevant life issue seems to be simmering within and how does this text address the relevant life issue particularly in behavior transformation which i get you know from this preacher i know about you know uh, uh that when you preach it ought to transform behavior right. but particularly what the text is encouraging us to do to believe or to become mm -hmm. and so for me the sermon i tell people if you watch me long enough it's so simple and it's probably not even profound mm -hmm. Um, I want to raise a relevant life issue, make you connect with it, make you see that relevant life issue in the text so that you and the text are now combined and how the text speaks to you in dealing with this relevant life issue. Mm -hmm. And it's really that simple, you know, and if, if God allows some grace to throw some celebration in, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you have to have some experiential preaching, uh, then, then it's all the better because that helps. Because I do believe this, that people remember, practice, and perform what they've celebrated, not what they've shouted, but what they've received as good news. And I think in our world, we have to be clear that celebration is not necessarily shouting because they're those, as you know, who want to reduce it to simply a charismatic, cathartic moment without understanding that this is much deeper. We're writing on what you call those inner tapes, those core mm -hmm. principles and values that allow people to grab onto that as good news and then they're encouraged to practice what the text prescribed. And so I bring in a little bit of, you know, my medical desire to want to help people, uh, but I believe the text prescribe. They, they teach us what to do, to believe, and to become. See, one of the things that, that the prescriptive homiletic that is what what's develops in the, in the PhD program is you get to name your own homiletic. Right. In other words, you're doing it already, mm -hmm. but you haven't named it. Right. So then you read in the field. Yeah. And then you put that together, and then you're able to name with a kind of exactness and clarity, what you're doing, why you're doing it. Mm. I mean, that's an excellent summary of your preaching. And I'm proud of it because you knew it, but naming it mm -hmm. is a function of being in the program. And to see how it didn't come ex nihilo. Right. You know, so when we're reading Paul Scott Wilson, I say, oh wait, Brian Chappell, Chappell, he, he has some of this, you know, and I can see the different homileticians who I may not have been exposed to, but were also in that line. So it now makes me actually more secure to know I didn't just create this out of thin air. I'm not some genius. This has been a train of thought in some scholars' minds for a while, and I've embraced that as well. So now I feel like I'm grounded because I see where my own methodology mm -hmm. is in the field, in the discussion, and now I can ask myself, and how do I contribute to that?